orange wines. Why is everyone talking about orange wines these days? Is this just another fad or trend or is something real happening here? Is orange the new red or rosé? Can't be the new black. <laughs> but tonight on the Sunday Sipper Club, we're gonna find out. So you're in the right place if you're curious about orange wines or wanna know more about them, where you can get them and uh, why you should try them. Uh, but before I dive into our topic and introduce our special guest tonight, in the comments below, let me know, have you ever tried an orange wine? Just yes or no. Have you tried an orange wine? I'd love to know if, uh, if you're familiar with the wines, if you've tried them, or you're just curious and have joined us here tonight. Because tonight we are going to have one of Canada's leading winemakers. She's been a force in the Canadian winemaking industry for biodynamic and organic wines. Now she's leading the charge on these orange wines. And I'm so pleased that Anne Sperling of Southbrook Vineyards can join us here tonight. Welcome, Anne. Hi, Natalie. It's great to be here. <laughs> ah, terrific. Now, first things first, Anne, we should clarify, were any oranges harmed in the making of this wine? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Okay. And, and by the way, I don't use roses in my rosé either. Oh, excellent. I'm so relieved. <laughs> and a guy named Frank doesn't make cap oh, We could go on forever. Yeah. Okay. Da -da 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 -da. Okay. And I'm going to be checking comments. Oh, excellent. We've already got people coming in the virtual door here, Anne, and they can see and hear us just fine. Thank you, Anne in Halifax, and welcome to everybody. If you're just joining us, have you had an orange wine? Yes or no in the comments below. So Anne, I guess um, first things first, can you give us a high level definition of what an orange wine is, please? So the, the, in the simplest definition, an orange wine is a skin fermented white wine. And, uh, and especially now that we have new, a new category in VQA Ontario, um, that's the that's the main um, the main thing that has to that, that we have to adhere to is that fermentation actually takes place on the skins of white grapes. Okay, great. And so um, it, it, I almost think it's like um, a white wine that's made like a red, which probably just confuses the heck out of everyone. But um, <laughs> let, tell tell me a few things about this. Um, there are some new um, laws around this in Ontario, but actually let's back up. You were the first one to sort of approach uh, uh, the VQA, yeah. Vintners Quality Alliance, about forming this group. So tell us about that. When did you do it? Why did you do it? Why did you want to create an orange wine category? Well, um, orange wine is something that's been around for, for, you know, probably thousands of years. So it's probably how most wine was made white or red um, before stainless steel and, and you know, presses and, and kind of modern winemaking since, you know, probably though was since the Second World War. And um, so, so it's kind of, it's going back to those uh, roots and looking at, you know, what is it that um, made white wines um, what they were, you know, way back when, but mm -hmm. also, um, but also thinking about the revival that's taken place in places like Georgia and north, the northeast of Italy, where um, these uh, wines are being made again. Yeah. And um, uh, with white wine making, we're very early, you know, we're pressing off the juice and we're leaving 35% of the grape behind. Okay. And so for me, I'm looking at, you know, I'm looking at um, this, the, the modern method and thinking, well, you know, they're also, there's also, you know, pressure on us to, as winemakers to consider additives and oak and tannin and you know these kind of additions to to even white wines and it and and when you look at what we're leaving behind or what when when we press what we put into the compost pile a lot of those um, elements are there yeah so I really wanted are, to explore these are the that natural the natural elements the sort of stuffing eh? like I see things floating in this yeah that are they're yeah. actually a good thing Right. or sinking as the case may be. Okay, sure. um, yeah, the, the, in this case, um, this orange wine was from uh, bottled with its lees. Okay. And uh, it's a wine that has been made uh, not only from biodynamic grapes with wild uh, yeast fermentation and wild malolactic, but with also with no additives of any kind, no sulfites. And, um, and that little bit of yeast in the bottom there um, is actually helping to keep the wine fresh. Excellent. So because it has no sulfites that what we traditionally 
um, or sorry, sulfites added, what we traditionally uh, associate as a preservative, how long will this wine last without it? Well, it's amazing. Um, there's a lot of life in these wines. They have the tannin from the stems as well as the skins. Okay. And uh, and the first uh, vintage was 2014 that, that I made, and it's still as fresh as the 2016. It's amazing when you open the bottles. So naturally, it has the natural stuffing to preserve it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Welcome, Paul and Patty. Um, good to see you guys here again tonight. They have not had an orange wine or even seen an orange wine. So this is all new to them. So I had to sort of take a crash course, I have to be honest, like to get up to speed on this <laughs> and to even ask you <laughs> halfway intelligent questions. But I'm intrigued. So you talked about it's actually an ancient tradition. You mentioned Georgia. Um, I've heard that Armenia ha ha used to do this mm -hmm. as the traditional white wine method of, of making white wines for 8,000 years. So, and then we sort of moved away from that maybe 40 or 50 years ago with white wine making, went to stainless steel, took out all of the, you know, the grape skins and everything else. Um, so why the revival now? Um, I think it's, it, it goes along with um, some of the some of the standardization of wine or the criticism that you know wines are are becoming uniform no matter where they come from, mm -hmm. and um, and so you know at Southbrook because we um, you know put so much effort into our vineyards and our and expressing our terroir, I wanted to you know dig deeper in that regard. So um, th this wine um, that we're um, exploring tonight is made from the Vidal grape and that's uh, that's one that everyone knows from ice wine yeah. and those amazing skins are um, are important for allowing the grapes to hang late into the season until everything freezes uh, for ice wine making but in fact there's a lot of flavor that's locked up in those skins that that when you make a um, just a regular white wine um, you, you don't really get into that and that's really you know I thought you know this is here we, we call that a terpenic variety where a what variety there's a, sorry terpenic so terpenic. there's ter yeah there's terpenes that okay. are those are yep. precursors okay. to aroma compounds okay. that are locked in the skins and if okay. you don't soak the skins or in this case ferment the skins you don't really get the full potential of the grape wow. so i really wanted to dig into that and and get more from you know from the this common grape that you know it's kind of our native variety and yeah. and um I, I wanted to understand it better yeah it's a tough little grape as you say it can survive yeah. winters to make ice wine and so it has also been viewed as a workhorse kind of grape because it's so tough but you're right it would contain a lot of um these as you call precursors, does that mean uh, aroma in potential that will eventually be released into the wine? Exactly. Except if you if all you do is press it off and and work with the juice, you don't really get close to the skin. You don't really um, have access to those compounds. And so by fermenting on the skins, those all of those are being released into the wine. So so as I'm sure you're tasting yes. there, there's all of this um, their savoriness that yes. comes through. You know, there's a lot of herbal um, mm. um, parts to the aroma. There's um, citrusy kind of bergamot, like Earl Grey tea, and um, and there's really not a lot of fruitiness, but. Um, which, which we, you know, we tend to associate with white wine. So I like to kind of warn people or tell people, you know, throw your fruity descriptors out the window <laughs> and dig into your, your spices and herbs and your tea box, you know, your jasmines and your florals and, and things like that. Fascinating. And it's, yeah. uh, how does it get that savory character? What, what is creating that? It's the skin contact, obviously, but how, how is that getting into this? Well, I think it's uh, it, there's um, it's completely fermented. So there's you know fermentation by yeast. There's fermentation by malolactic bacteria. There's probably a little bit of brett in there as well. What's and brett? All, For those who don't know, Brettanomyces is what or brett? Brit, yeah, Brettanomyces is an, it's another yeast 
Um, it, uh, it tends to be associated with kind of some earthy, barnyardy kind of notes that, uh, you know, it's kind of famous in Burgundy and, and, um, and other reds, roans and things like that. And some but, people call um, it a fault though, right? Yeah, it depends on, it, it can be if it overtakes the wine, but okay. if it's there as a subtle, so, so the Britannomyces yeast are actually, they're acting on, um, sugars that, um, Sorry, Britannomyces is acting on sugars that Saccharomyces can't access. Okay. So they ferment a little bit. They make the wine a little bit more dry, mm -hmm. and um, but they also have um, the compounds that are adding to the earthiness and mm -hmm. often sort of a richness to the wine. It's so it's definitely there. Wow. Yeah, you get all of that depth, and I think that's where all of the savoriness is coming. And of course, in this case, I'm using stems also. I'm fermenting okay. on the skins, but also the stems. And that so doesn't have, make it too tannic. No, I well, I mean, it's it's much more tannic than if they weren't in there. Sure. Um, but um, but I think that's contributing to the herbal and savoriness of the wine. So it's uh, there's a lot of. Um, uh, tannins and uh, catechins that are there in the seeds and stems that give uh, this wine a real uh, texture in the mid palate. Mm -hmm. So the skins are an oak. We associate more with the finish in a wine. Okay. There's no oak in this. Wow. So the, the tannin hit is kind of on the attack and then it finishes very fresh with the, with the dryness and the acidity. It does. And yet there's so much texture. There's so much body to this without it being heavy. It's, it's a pretty incredible wine. Um, and we, just uh, practically speaking, we can only get this from the winery, is that right? Or? At, this, at this point, um, yes, it's, uh, it's available at the winery. Um, okay. We ship, of course, so we can okay. ship to, um, you know, anywhere in Ontario, no problem. And mm -hmm. we ship to many places in Canada. Sure. Um, and of course, we have restaurants that, are, um, that have been, um, be, been able to access this wine for uh, like a year and a half now. So um, now that it has VQA, we just can kind of proclaim it a little further and a little wider. So right. Yeah. And are you noticing any um, restaurant wine list now uh, adopting an orange wine category, or at least some more orange wines? Are they kind of lumped in with white wines? What are you seeing in restaurants? Yeah, I think we're seeing it um, standing apart, um, and I think it's the restaurants that um, include orange wines on their list often are very connected with the the food community, the local food producers, and um, and you know it's just it's a really interesting um, uh, flavor profile, you know, that savoriness that we don't always delve into. So, so the restaurants that are supportive are also, you know, very connected to what they're doing. Absolutely. I would think that savoriness yeah. would lend itself to even a steak or anything sort of caramelized or with that savory character they call, do you say umami? <laughs> Yeah, umami. umami. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, working with meats, um, it kind of enhances that meatiness. But, yes. um, but uh, like in the spring, we were serving it with um, asparagus and poached egg on, you know, on a noodle wow. kind of um, base. It was really lovely. And uh, but you can put it with barbecue, you know, the sauces, mm. the pulled porks, you know, and those kind of things, too, because it kind of cuts through some of the greasiness some of the sweetness in the sauces and really freshens your palate again. That's amazing. I, I, I actually want to go and just try it right now. <laughs> but, you <laughs> yeah. know, when I, really, you're making me hungry, which is good. But when I think of eggs and asparagus, especially two of the biggest, uh, toughest foods we associate in terms of wine pairing, they, they have these natural yeah. compounds themselves that really tend to smother or kill or clash against wine. So it'd be really interesting to try an orange wine with those. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and of course, anything, any other fermented foods, so salamis, prosciuttos, cheeses, okay. you know, a wide range of, of those kind of things also are just automatic uh, natural pairings for orange wines. Awesome. So Bruno Ravello de Sousa says he's produced one orange wine this year with an Italian grape variety. Bruno, where are you logging in from? I assume 
you're in Italy. <laughs> but let us know. And if you're just joining us here on the Sunday Sipper Club, we're talking about orange wines, natural wines. We'll get to some of Anne Sperling's other wines. She's from Southbrook. She has a vast history, very prestigious history in the winemaking industry here in Canada, a leader in biodynamic and organic wines. So she has a lot to share with us tonight. So Anne, um, one of the things I was reading about orange wines is that some people question if, uh, if it's... Um, if they mask the terroir or the typicity of the grape or that sort of thing, that that, that seems to be uh, one of the counter arguments that I come across when it comes to orange wines. Uh, how do you respond to that? Well, in, in um, I, I think that once we learn and understand these wines as well as we know our reds and our whites from the region, we'll, we'll start to recognize specific traits. But um, I know when, when I was looking at what we grow at Southbrook in the way of white varieties and which ones might lend themselves to this process because, of course, after the fermentation, after the malolactic, and because I, I wanted to set a really high bar for myself in making it a natural wine, I'm not able to adjust the acidity or bring the pH down into a lower range or things like that. So I wanted something that you know, based on our vineyard, not just the varietal, but that would, you know, result in a balanced wine after all of that. And, um, and I think that, you know, terroir is, is coming through in that way, in the kind of the natural harmony of the wine. And, um, and so, so it's just going to take us some time to be able to recognize it. Sure. And you're using more yeah. of the grape. I mean, you're not throwing away the, yeah. the, the skin. So yeah, uh, yeah perhaps exactly. it's even more representative as opposed to less. Um, and so, uh, but take me back, it was March, 2016, you approached the VQA, which is the regulatory body for wines here in Ontario. Um, at the time you were making an orange wine, but you could not label it anything other than product of Canada and could not put VQA on it, our symbol of uh, quality and standards. Um, so, what did you propose to them and, and why did you want to get it out of that sort of generic labeling? Well, um, I think uh, the VQ, I, I've been kind of part of the VQA since the since even before it existed. So the very first meeting that we had, um, I was in British Columbia at the time that that introduced the concept to the to the winemakers I was part of. And so, you know, I was I've been part of the standards committee and and things like that over the years. And uh, so, you know, I, I believe in the system and I wanted to. Um, not only be able to make the wine and, you know, and, and um, uh, introduce it to consumers at all levels, but I thought that, you know, there's no reason not to have this in our standards. And it's, it's unusual to have, um, like, if you look at other Appalachian systems, they often accommodate orange wines in the white wine category. But um, but we still maintain a tasting panel for the VQA, and because the wine was atypical in color, in often cloudiness, um, the savoriness, all of the, we have a, a requirement for varietal character in our white wines, um, and so all many of those things were making it difficult for the tasting panel to approve the wines. So um, so we we chose to um, create a new category. And um, and so it was a you know a bit of a, a steep learning curve for many of the parts of the of the VQA system, but but um, I think it it demonstrates that you know that that it is an evolving thing, and uh, and so we were able to put some put some uh, standards around it, and and now you know we can we're we're among the the very few Appalachian systems in the world that recognizes orange wine separately. That's awesome. And you were the first to establish that. Um, Paul has a question. With the residual sugars and yeast, do you experience a second fermentation over time? Uh, so um, this is completely dry in every respect. So okay. there, isn't, there isn't any residual sugar. Okay. Um, and uh, so this wine goes to bottle with, with you know, virtually no potential for re-fermentation. Ah. Okay, as there would be with champagne where they have the dosage, the sweetness that will re-ferment 
inside the bottle, trap the bubbles exactly. and so on. So this is dry to begin with. Good question, Paul. Yeah. Um, okay, so where do you think um, this category is heading for orange wines? What do you think is the next step for orange wines? Other than, of course, wider acceptance, that sort of thing, but what, what would you like to see happen? Well, I, I think that um, there's, there's a lot of regionality happening. I'll use the, I'll, I'll kind of use that word um, with orange wine. So, so uh, producers are digging into their heritage varieties and, you know, I'm thinking internationally, but they're, but they're taking this, these small batches and they're, you know, selling them at their local restaurants. And it's a, it's a really great way for, um, you know, consumers to engage with the local um, agricultural community. And so, and I, and I think that's really what I'd like to see happen with orange wines is, you know, lots of small batches and lots of like engagement um, at a really, you know, a really um, uh, foodie level, like right there, you know, with your plate of whatever, um, you know, your local fresh vegetables and, and uh, you know, locally raised meats and things like that. And uh, to really kind of start thinking about winemakers as as farmers and as, you know, people that are making their meals more interesting. Absolutely. And you refer to yourself yeah. as a wine grower. Yeah, that yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yes. But it but it's really, you know, it's the engagement with consumer. I think that that we have some barriers to that with, you know, a big organization like the LCBO mm -hmm. um, distributing our wines and making, you know, making it more distant um, from the consumers. And sure, it's more convenient for everyone. But at the same time, I think we want to, you know, engage and and realize, you know, that our, our wine and our food are coming from our local um, our local agriculture. Absolutely. So let's also clear up um, another sort of understanding of these different categories that are emerging. Another hot, trendy term um, or category these days is natural wine. So how does um, an orange wine differ from a natural wine? Is this a natural wine for starters? And how is it, how would it might be different from natural wines? So um, um, natural wines, um, so within something like the VQA, we don't have a category for natural wines, but, um, but there is um, kind of um, an unwritten and, in, and there's, there are some groups trying to put some definition around it about what a natural wine is. And, um, and again, it's like a counter movement to um, the industrialization of, of wine. And uh, so, um, so the, the basic concept of natural wine is that it's grapes from the vineyard fermented and bottled. So it's not, you know, it's not, um, uh, having additives and, you know, especially f compounds that are foreign to grapes. So, you know, oak being one of them, but, um, but there's, you know, other things that, um, that are added like acacia gums and, you know, uh, what, things what like is that, that. That you just mentioned, um, acacia gums? Yeah, like gum arabic. So it's coming from a tree, you know, a tropical tree, and it okay. adds body to a wine. Wow. And it's like, you know, wine doesn't wine doesn't need that, um, but it gets, you know, those those kinds of additives get used. So um, so this so natural wines. The concept is to um, ferment with wild yeast. Um, often there's no or low sulfites added and, um, and other additives are either non-existent or kept to an absolute minimum. Um, in the case of this, um, orange wine from Southbrook, it is, uh, it's, it's the, as far as I'm concerned, it's the highest standard for a natural wine. So, um, biodynamic, uh, grapes fermented with, um, uh, hand picked and foot trodden grapes. Oh, really? And, you trod uh, on all your yeah. grapes. <laughs> do yeah. you have a team, yeah. team of people who do that? Well, it's not a big batch, right? Oh, okay. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's relatively small, but uh, hand harvested grapes, we, we sorted them. Um, and as they came off the sorting table, we collected them in about 250 kilo lots. And, um, and then they were foot tread briefly to break up maybe about a third of the berries. And that just kind of gets the liquid in contact with the skins. And, um, and then the fermentation started from there. 
um, because there's this amazing matrix of um, whole clusters and stems, the fermentation is very gentle. It's a, the, some of the heat is diffused by the stems because they're not sweet and it doesn't really form a, a, a cap like red wine, like that cap that gets uh, yeah, pushed up. At the top and then they punch right. it down sometimes, yeah. Right, and so we don't really have to punch down. We just kind of manage the surface and okay. um, in, in, it's fermented in small lots so we keep it closed and it's more like an infusion. So it's a very gentle interaction between the, the fermentation and um, and all of the components. And, and is it then a slower we, fermentation? Does it tend to be um, slower, more no, days? No? Not necessarily. Okay. Um, this was, uh, in, in each vintage that I've made it, usually by two to three weeks of skin contact, the fermentation is finished. I like to let the malolactic um, complete. And uh, so I'm usually pressing it after about a month, 26 to 32 days, somewhere in that range. Okay. Um, and then uh, the wine basically is um, in, in a tank to settle and we rack it a couple of times just to, as the as the yeast and the cloudiness settles and then we go to bottle so it's a uh, pretty uh very straightforward but also um there's a a really lovely balance that is you know that just comes out of it and, and i think yeah, yeah. and yeah. stephen in waterloo says uh, he's just joining us is orange wine always made with the vidal grape this one is Anne. but have you made an orange wine with any other grape or do you intend to um, actually, I've been making uh, orange wine at Sperling Vineyards in my uh, family's uh, property in BC. Kelowna, BC, and there, um, there I use Pinot Gris. Oh. Um, we uh, we have a small amount of Vidal there, and okay. uh, so I did a little trial with Vidal um, this past year. But I like I like both varieties. I think um, the Vidal and other aromatic varieties. So if you look. Um, around there's a few new introductions so Vineland Estates did uh, um, an orange wine from in 2016 from Chardonnay Mosquet which right. is a an aromatic uh, Chardonnay variety right. and um, and others have done uh, with Riesling yes. um, and uh, so there's you know you can use a range of varieties in BC they've got um, at Haywire, they've used Pinot Gris and Sauvignon Blanc, not together, but separate. And we also have Pearl Morissette. Um, they've worked with Chardonnay and Riesling together. And um, and I think they did one a couple of years ago that included Viognier. Wow. So you really, yeah, you really get a lot of um, interesting aromas and textures, you know, depending on the variety. So it's, it's not restricted. Um, if you look internationally, as I was mentioning, there's a lot of producers that have kind of, they've dug into their uh, traditional or regional varieties and kind of are bringing those back into um, interest, um, you know, and into the conversation to revive some of those varieties because often they have higher acidity and, um, and with, you know, climate change and things like that, they're often, you know, just more suited to, to where they're growing. Um, and if you're making wine without additives, then you need you need all that you need the acidity you need the texture absolutely and um rochelle yeah. has joined us from ottawa she says she loves southbrook uh wines and cheers to you Anne. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks rochelle um lise is up in northern ontario and refresh your screen lise and i bet you you will see us um dave uh dave hey dave dave has formed a support <laughs> club support group for the sunday sippers club which i just learned about yesterday anyway thank you dave Post the link in here below, Dave. I'd love everybody to see where you folks are at. I can't believe it, we have a support group. Um, <laughs> he's on the patio right now with some rosé. Uh, Stephen asks, so orange wine is more of a process than a white, than a wine grape per se, he's asking, Anne. Yes, yep, I would say that that's a really accurate assessment. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, Lori's yeah. here from Ottawa. She's watching with her four-year-old granddaughter. Excellent, Lori. Uh, okay, and if you're just joining us, we're here with Ann Sperling of Southbrook Vineyards, Sperling Vineyards in BC, Ontario. And I, we're talking about orange wines. We're gonna shift a little bit now, but in the comments below, let me know. Um, have you ever had an orange wine? 
or and or what's in your glass tonight. So we've sort of differentiated between natural wines and orange wines. Is there, uh, what would be the key differences between an orange wine and an organic, are all orange wines organic and or biodynamic, Anne? Um, the, they don't have to be, okay. um, and, uh, so it's, uh, especially like within the VQA rules, we, we wanted to create a framework around, um, the methodology and, um, you know, the resulting textures and, and flavors. Yeah. So, um, uh, so, so we, we didn't restrict it to organic production, but, um, but, you know, we're seeing, you know, kind of more of that, especially with, uh, producers that want to make the wines natural. Okay. Um, Sorry, I've so, got a fly in. You got fly. It's, I think it's that same fly as when you did the teaser video. Yeah. You have trained a, a, a higher breed of uh, fruit flies because they're natural. <laughs> yeah, maybe. They survive anything. <laughs> That's great. Oh, they, they only drink orange wines, though. Um, all right. So we have talked about orange natural wines. Of course, uh, you have a premium line of... Uh, organic biodynamic wines with Southbrook. Um, let's talk about, let's shift gears, although we'll still take questions on uh, natural and orange wines, on the this line you call seriously cool. Maybe give us some background on what these wines are, why they got named this way, and how they're different from <laughs> the orange wines. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, seriously cool, we have a, a red blend, a okay. really approachable red blend. We have a Chardonnay, and, uh, and a rosé, which is a, a blend. And um, what we were, um, what we wanted to do is create a place for um, organic growers that were in, that whose vineyards were in transition. Um, so that means that uh, during the three year period that, um, that their, their vineyards would be farmed organically, but not yet certified. Um, there, we need a place for those grapes because we want to support those growers through that, that time. But okay. those, um, and so that's where, that's really the origin of this. So we felt that, you know, we could make them broadly available through the LCBO. We could make them, you know, delicious and approachable wines and, um, and that they would, you know, help us to uh, work with growers who are um, soon to be organic. So it's literally like a, a farm team. So that yeah, before yeah, they get yeah, up into exactly. the, the big leaks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. Great. yeah, no, that's a that's a really great analogy. Yeah. I love the fun sort of labeling, the lots of color. Of course, the cool is associated with the cool climate and the cool method of, of winemaking. Maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, seriously cool. I mean, the labels, um, you'll, you've will you got three bottles of three different ones. But yes. in fact, each label series has three um, designs so when you see it on the shelf you're going to see like so for example here's here's ah, the okay. the red one of the reds that i have right and uh the rosé um there's one of the rosé labels so you can see they're really fun and yeah. colorful yes. and um and our, our label designer uh has a, a personal project that is meant just to bring joy um, and nice. and so she worked with the the colors and the combinations and her um, her website for um, for fun and you know just making life a little more joyous and uh, and that's that's where um, these labels came from and then the seriously cool um, it's something that um, Bill Riddlemeyer the owner of Southbrook had been involved in and. Um, to kind of introduce Canadian wines internationally and to kind of really emphasize that we have a cool climate, but we're, and, you know, we've been making wine for, um, for, an, you know, a number of generations now and, uh, and that, you know, we're, we're um, really behind our climate in the sense that we embrace the characteristics, the freshness, the, the floral, the fruity um, that comes from our cool climate. Absolutely. So Stephen has um, is still or is still uh, fascinated by the orange wines. He's saying, OK, so orange processed versus orange wine on my label may be more helpful to consumers. Agree or disagree? 
Okay, so Stephen, I'm not sure if I understand, but Anne may get more what you're saying here. <laughs> Having orange processed or orange wine on the label might be more helpful to consumers. Do you have any comments on that, Anne? Um, well, one of the things that we felt uh, was important at the VQA level was to uh, use the term skin fermented white. Okay. And so the label um, that uh, I think the label that you have and the label that I still have, yeah. um, it's our old label. So you can see it says uh, orange wine and yes. uh, there's no um, uh, a vineyard reference it says our farm so it's a non VQA okay. label right. um, but in the VQA version it says uh, the orange wine part is actually very small it says okay. skin fermented white and Vidal so it gives consumers a clue that it's it's a grape they might already know but a methodology that they might not have tried before okay great and you may also put, um, is it optional to put amber wine as well on the label? Um, yep, amber is, amber or orange uh, can be used uh, as synonyms, but uh, the skin fermented white has to be there. Okay, skin fermented white. Okay. Uh, Stephen says, really like Anne because she is inventive and always pushing the art of winemaking. She's great. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and Rochelle says, as um, she, Rochelle is a natural nutritionist and she's a sommelier. She truly appreciates these wines and all that you do, Anne. What about ideal food pairings for orange wines for the season? So Anne has mentioned a few of these earlier um, in our show, but um, Anne, do you have some more suggestions for us with that savory character the orange wine has? What else would you put on the table? Well, um, I'm gonna let you in on a on a secret that uh, that sommeliers don't really want to reveal, and that <laughs> orange wines are for the lazy songs, right? <laughs> and, and what that means is that you can you can pair orange wine with almost anything. So I would say, you know, if you're if you're the type that's experimenting with orange wine, then just try it. You know, try it with right. the things you love, because um, um, because it it really does connect with with so many different foods. So, and I was like I was saying earlier, you know, anything that's fermented. So, yeah. you know, including the traditional fermented foods um, and vegetables like kimchi and, and sauerkraut, um, along with, um, you know, cheeses, all kinds of, of preserved meats. And, um, but then, you know, whatever is kind of, um, you know, rich and tasty that you're bringing, taking off the barbecue, um, grilled veggies, you know, anything like that. It really, there's a, there's, there's just something there, that savoriness, that umami that connects, um, with, uh, with cooked foods. And is it that, uh, the, the fermentation process in these other foods, uh, like cheese is, is it that element that produces the umami, the savoriness that sort of talks to the savoriness in the wine? Is that what's? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I would say, yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, all right. So you're uh, seriously cool. Let's break that one open. I don't know if you have it there, okay. but I'm going to give that yeah. one a try. And uh, maybe you could um, describe this one a little bit. You've, you've sort of talked about it's it, cool and fresh. And now we're into fruity, not not Earl Grey tea or anything. <laughs> So this uh, seriously cool Chardonnay, it's from the 2016 vintage okay. and uh, a big uh, portion of the blend comes from um, uh, an excellent uh, organic grower, uh, Heather Laundrie. She has a vineyard that's on the lake shore in Lincoln. So it's okay. um, it has a really close proximity to Lake Ontario. So it's a cool site. Mm -hmm. She grows Chardonnay Musquet there. So um, it's a it's an aromatic version of Chardonnay, it is. and uh, yeah, nice. and really gives like a fresh and floral kind of note to the wine. It's made without oak, um, and um, and it's quite soft on the palate. So um, it's a it's dry, just slightly um, off dry. There's about four grams of residual sugar there, mm -hmm. but because the acidity is quite soft, it's very approachable. Yeah, it tastes dry and uh, so, yeah, yeah, very floral, not almost as uh, floral as a Riesling, but not quite. It's it's quite expressive for Chardonnay, which I associate more with the blousy, buttery, whatever, when, it, when it's oaked. But it's interesting that you note the, the, uh, the vineyard grower in your description it reminds me of great restaurants and on their restaurant list they'll note their local producers who provides yeah. the mushrooms and who you know where are they getting all of these ingredients so this is lovely and 
The price point of these seriously cool wines is around. Um, they're fourteen ninety five. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Are they yeah. available across yeah. Canada or just in Ontario right now? They're just Ontario. Okay, but you would yeah. ship them, would you? Yes. Yeah. Yep, we you can ship them. from the winery for sure. Okay. Perfect. Um, yeah, and uh, the LCBO carries them generally um, in Ontario. Okay, terrific. Yeah. Okay, so there's a bit of a latency with the comments, So, uh, but I do want to uh, acknowledge, Paul is asking if you know of any U.S. winemakers making orange wines, Anne. Um, well, actually, um, uh, during the I4C, there was one of the producers from Sonoma, a producer called Scribe, and okay. uh, they're making uh, an orange Chardonnay. And in fact, they start they they um, the the variety that kind of got them started on the skin fermented part was actually a Chardonnay Mosquet, oh. and they felt that um, the oh. wine was maybe lacking a bit of structure and so they went deeper and deeper into the skins into the stems and then you know it sort of became a thing um for them so they use um regular clones of chardonnay and the chardonnay mosquet now but um but that was really uh, a fun one to try at the i4c um to be hands go and I4C, just for those who don't know, is the International Cool Climate, Chardonnay Cool Climate Festival. I probably got the words jumbled. Yeah, there, celebration. Yeah, yeah, yeah celebration. exactly. That happens yeah. in Niagara every year in late July. And yeah. everybody, there, there are a lot of winemakers from cool climate regions making a cool climate Chardonnay in that style that come and everybody shares the wines and there's events and tastings and everything else. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Anyway, <laughs> there we go. Uh, let's um, let's take a look at this one. This is a red wine blend. You're red. You're red. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is um, uh, predominantly uh, Pinot Noir. Okay. Um, but it's blended with uh, some Gamay, a little bit of Syrah, and um, a little bit of uh, Zweigelt. So. Um, um, all all varieties that add you know freshness to uh, red wine. Mm. Um, again, this was only aged in older barrels, so there's not really an oaky component to it. It's a 2013, so it's got um, a little bit of um, complexity from um, age. It was bottled um, more recently, so the aging took place in the cellar. Yep. But um, but I think it's um, you know a really nice versatile red. Absolutely, it just leaps out of the glass. That's that's pretty uh, great, yeah. especially at this price point. It's just so like, poof, wants to get out of the glass. That's great. Um, and what would you pair with this, uh, perhaps? Well, um, I like to think about these as you know wines that are um, versatile, but. For me, Pinot Gamay, you know, this kind of blend, it's it's definitely something for uh, grilling and uh, barbecue season. So, you know, I love it with burgers, but um, but you can do your your you know your veggies, your grilled veggies, and you know that kind of thing too. So, um, right now I've got a lot of zucchinis in my uh, coming out of my garden. Yeah. So uh, so grilling, you know, getting them nice and little some black lines on them and uh, bringing out that grilled taste. I think it's a really nice way to uh, offset the the fruitiness of this wine. Absolutely. Ah. Oh. Again, yeah. I just really want to just wrap this up. And, <laughs> I'm so hungry. You're good at, good at doing that. Um, okay. And then you have the rosé, right? Yes. I don't think yeah. I have it with me, but maybe oh, you can show okay. us the rosé. Yeah, can okay. you see it there? Yeah, this I is um, it. yeah. it's a wines to watch, and okay. um, this rosé is a blend of uh, Pinot Noir and Vidal actually, okay. and uh, Vidal coming again from Heather Laundry. She's a very dedicated organic grower, and uh, she's converting another um, block of of vines to organic for us. So, mm. so it was a nice way to kind of bring. Um, uh, bring a little bit of um, acidity and tightness to to the blend and um, uh, along with those nice cherry um, pinot notes absolutely and it's the same price yeah. point as well right? yeah yeah 14.95 yeah really good really affordable um, yeah, absolutely and I'm just gonna refresh here and just make sure I'm still catching the comments because they do mm -hmm. fly by pretty quickly. Awesome. All right. And I applaud you guys for being here on a long weekend. I thought it'd be just you and me, Anne. <laughs> like, everybody's at the cottage, it's just us. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> but a lot of people have have told me they're going to catch the replay afterwards, which is the beauty of Facebook Live. So, so Anne, is there anything that um, we haven't covered that you'd like to talk about, uh, whether it whether it's associated with orange wines, natural wines, the cool wines that we just uh, covered, or anything else that you'd like to share with our audience before we wrap up tonight? Well, I guess um, um, I know I've mentioned the the I four C and um, that event uh, has come and gone. But what was really wonderful about that experience once again is uh, putting our wine side by side with you know equal and and great producers from around the world, yeah. and um, and really you know being able to um, see uh, the the. Uh, how well our wines perform, um, but that you know we have we have these delicious wines and these great wines that we're making in in the Niagara region, and you know they they stand um, with the best in the world. So I just, do, you know indeed. it's yeah it's nice to you know just kind of make that point that you know we're proud of what we do and and we've got a lot as uh, as Canadians to be proud of uh, you know for all our winemakers. So. Absolutely, and we are yeah. so proud of you, Anne. Um, you stand <laughs> shoulder to shoulder with the best worldwide. You're a real leader, an innovator, a pioneer, and um, that's why you're the first guest I've had here uh, for the second time on the Sunday Sipper Club. Uh, we really appreciate your time with us tonight. Thank you for the, the gift of the wines you've given us and produced, and uh, we're looking forward to following your progress and what you do next because, um, you know, you keep us on the leading edge of wine yeah. and of taste. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Yeah, cheers. Okay, cheers. <laughs> and folks, I'm going to keep okay. going here, but uh, Anne will bid adieu to you and uh, okay. good luck. Okay, <laughs> Okay, bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Okay, folks, I'm going to stay online here a little bit longer. Um, just to wrap up for tonight, I know it's a long weekend, so I do appreciate you being here. Uh, Stephen Niagara rocks. Yes. Yay. <laughs> okay, guys. And, you know, I just want to mention while we're here on our own, I recently uh, received this as a sample. It's from BC. Uh, it's an orange wine and it says rhymes with door hinge. <laughs> so, and then I um, also, I just want to show you kind of what's come in lately. Um, this pixie wine, but I think it's a rosé. I don't think this technically from uh, Rose Hall Run, I believe it is, yeah, is an orange wine. But uh, I got to tell you, th this is really interesting, very savory, as Anne was saying, like almost like tea leaves and that savory bergamot character. So I just want to uh, share with you wh who and what is coming up uh, for the Sunday Sipper Club. So next weekend, um, we have Kevin Broch. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. I will get it before we bring him on here. But he's been on the Food Network a lot. I think he was, uh, his show was called The Thirsty Traveler. So uh, he deals with a lot of different types of uh, drinks, not just wine. But um, he's got a wealth of experience because he's a world traveler. And he's gone to the places that make different types of wines. We'll focus on the wines with him. Then on the 20th, we've got Norm Hardy. And I know a lot of you are fans of Norm Hardy from Picton, Prince Edward County. He does make an orange wine, by the way. Um, so we'll find out what's up with Norm. The 27th, we've got Caroline LeBlanc from Torres Winery in Chile. So if you're a fan of their wines, uh, or I should say Spain, Spain, but they also have a winery in Chile. Um, let's see, September 3rd, it's Escaping Me, then it's Laura, Laura Catena. She's an emergency room doctor in San Francisco, Dr. Laura Catena. And in her spare time, uh, she runs a winery, several wineries with her father in Argentina. Catena is kind of the first family of wine in Argentina. And then beyond that, we've got the wine economist. We've got Laura Worland, who's a world expert in wine and cheese pairing. We've got so much coming up this fall for you on the Sunday Sipper Club. It's gonna be amazing. Some of you loved my chat with Paul Mabray on social media and wine. I did that three years ago and that post still has life. It's had like 92 shares on Facebook and it just goes on and on. So I thought it's time to update that post or that discussion. So we'll have Paul back with us in the fall. Um, so anything else, I'm going to refresh my browser. 
Uh, if you are all sort of slipping into your long weekend Sunday, that is just great. I'm so glad you could be here. Uh, but I think I'm going to wrap this up for now. As always, you can post in the comments. And even if you're watching the video replay, you did, weren't able to join us live, still please post in the comments because Anne Sperling and I will be back in this post to comment, to answer questions, even after the fact, uh, because we love to keep this discussion going. It's, it's great. It's interesting. Um, but it, this uh, video, this discussion, this group has life after the fact. And speaking of that, Dave Head, if you're still here, I don't know if you are, <laughs> he formed a support group for the Sunday Sipper Club. Yes, there's a private support group. At first I thought, why are you doing that? Did I, have you all been psychologically traumatized by me here <laughs> that you need? Uh, look, I just posted it and it even has its own visual. So you can ask to join the Sunday Sippers Support Club group on Facebook. I am there, so I will see if you're posting what you're posting. But um, apparently it's just a group, um, sort of an after party group uh, that likes to gather or be connected that way. So I'm so impressed, Dave Head, that you did that. Um, and I will uh, be in there myself too, posting. Uh, Stephen, you're welcome. Excellent, he's off to grill some shrimp. So yes, I've got to grill something with this wine, this fabulous wine, oh my goodness. So good night. Have a great long weekend, folks. <laughs> yes, it is. Oh, you're in there, Paul. Okay, I'll see you next weekend right here on the Sunday Sipper Club at 6 p.m. Eastern, Toronto, New York time. We'll be back with Kevin Brotch. He's a real lively guy, so you won't want to miss that discussion. He's funny. He's been around the world, and you're going to love him. Um, so I will see you then. Take care. <laughs>